Hello, I'm Robert Royal. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Catholic Thing, which is a daily online column series. And this is one of the podcasts of The Catholic Thing, um, which we're bringing to you on Sunday, November 12, which it'll appear on Monday, September, uh, November 13. So uh, please keep that in mind as you listen to this discussion. I'm joined uh, again by my friend and colleague, Father Gerald Murray, who's a priest of the Archdiocese of New York, a canon lawyer, and a much uh, sought-after commenter on things Catholic these days. Father Murray, good to see you again. Thank you, um, Bob. Good to be with you. I'm feeling a little bit like I didn't want to do what we're doing today, because when we started this series, I thought it was primarily going to be devoted to the Synod on Synodality. And in the two weeks uh, the Synod ex it finished exactly two weeks ago with, with, with a closing Mass. In the last two weeks, we've had four or five absolutely amazing developments. And in this past week, we've had a couple that I thought it would be worthwhile for, our, for us to discuss and for our, our listeners and our viewers um, to hear about. So um, I'm glad to have you back. And there are two things in particular that I, I would like to talk about, and then we may get into some other things uh, afterward. There, there were two developments last week that actually provoked me to, to try to convene this, uh, this podcast. One, of course, is the um, Vatican issuing of a, a statement about the status of trans people, whether they can be baptized, whether they can be godparents and you know, other things. And we'll get into that in, in, in a second. And the other, of course, is the removal of Bishop Strickland from his post in Tyler, Texas. So he, Holy Father asked him to resign. He thought that as a bishop, he could not resign. And so he was, he was actually removed by the Holy Father. So I'd like to look at primarily these two topics in this session. And I'd like to look at each of them in a couple of different ways. To start with, since you're a canon lawyer, uh, what is your reading of this statement about trans people just in strictly um, legal canonical legal terms, because on the surface, it seems in one way to be unoffensive. Uh, in another way, if you begin to look more deeply into it, there are all sorts of possible implications of baptizing people who are trans, allowing them to participate in, in various ways in church activities. So let's begin there, and then we'll maybe move on to some broader considerations. Sure. Well, canonically speaking, uh, the, the the document speaks about transsexuals as if it's a category of human beings that the church accepts and that now it enjoys legal uh, protection as a category. It cannot be uh, determined simply that someone who claims to be a transsexual uh, is engaging in behavior or thinking that offends the gospel. So uh, we're entering into the realm now where the sexual revolution is being laid out uh, as categories that enjoy uh, canonical favor. And I find that very troubling. Uh, certainly the issue of uh, the qualifications in canon law to receive baptism have to include an acceptance of Catholic teaching and uh, the promise or the pledge to live a virtuous life. Uh, so on the level of doctrine, if someone is claims that God made a mistake when they were born a man, they're really a woman. This goes against Catholic teaching. We call it Catholic, Christian anthropology, but just the basic notion that we, we don't create ourselves. We simply uh, are what God made us. And then on the level, we could say of uh, qualifications uh, to receive baptism. Can you say that you're living a life in accord with the gospel if you deny the created order in your own life? I don't think so. So, uh, this is a problem. Uh, as a non canon lawyer, obviously myself, when I look at what that document was, that statement was trying to do, it looked like it was trying to parse out the law in a very narrow way. In other words, there's, there's nothing in canon law that says a trans person cannot be baptized. I mean, obviously, the, that, the, the very term trans has been recently kind of concocted in an ideological way, and it's been... Um, as I think you rightly say, it's, it's being advanced under the auspices of fairness and openness and whatnot. But the strictness seems to be that because the words 
don't appear that we they, you're banned from being baptized because you're trans, that therefore there is no problem. And it seems to me that there is a lar- larger set of implications here that we're just kind of accepting. And, and I, I think it's intended in the wake of uh, the Synod on Synodality, it's intended to show a kind of openness or in a kind of, a, of an accompaniment that, as you rightly say, seems to contradict some very deep ideas and, and, and in fact, to embrace this kind of Gnostic view that who I am is not the body in which I, I, I was born. We have this absurd phrase that's used in the secular world that people had a gender assigned at birth as if a baby who comes out with male genitals or female genitals is, is being assigned to society, something that's an imposition on that person. So it just, it, it, I, I just wondered, canon law, of course, can't cover everything, but it seems like that is the, 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 the kind of um, manipulation almost of the actual words of canon law to allow something that, if you look in other places, seems to contradict the spirit and even the letter of canon law. Yes, and Bob, that absurd phrase you just referred to is in this document. Uh, it, it refers to people's what they, they have reassignment surgery or take hormones. We don't believe in reassignment. Uh, that is a ridiculous notion. Now, consider this. If a man who claims to be a woman and requests baptism uh, shows up at church in a dress uh, and then wants to be called, you know, a, by a female name when they're obviously a man, isn't this making a mockery of the gospel and of Christ's teaching? I think it is. I I, therefore, I find your point is correct. This is part, partly due, or in, in great part due, to this notion that we have to be nice to people where they are in order to show that we're being faithful to Christ. And I would say niceness is not what Christ came to the world to give. He came to give truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Telling someone who's a man, you're a man, not a woman, that's the truth. And if the person embraces it, then, of course, we can baptize them. But then they will have shed this pretense of being a transsexual. Yeah, I think we mentioned this in our previous episode, but it strikes me that that when what we've seen since the the synodality, the synod on synodality began, was an attention to one set of experiences. In other words, people immediately in this this uh, LGBT category that's been created in, in recent years. But we don't look at the experience of people like parents and whatnot who find themselves suddenly dealing with a child, and this has really become a social contagion, who uh, em- embraces this kind of uh, trans idea, I was born the wrong way, and particularly young girls hmm. who are finding themselves confronted with a lot of, of uh, threatening things in, in our society don't want to be that. They want to be men because they think that the males have... Uh, of other privileges. This seems to me to, 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 to reflect a, a kind of a imbalance in how we're approaching dealing with experience. There are threats. There are threats to those children who are going undergoing these, these procedures uh, at a young age. It's, there are threats to, to just ordinary parents who want to protect their kids from this ideology, the social contagion. But that, that somehow never gets registered in what we've been seeing in, in the last couple of years. So I think that's a, a larger part of this conversation that we're going to have to continue to keep in mind as we go forward. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, because we try to keep these, these uh, podcasts short. But I want to move on to that second uh, large category of things that I think has certain parallels with, with what we've just been saying. And that is this removal of Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas. Now, the Vatican hasn't really given any specific reason why he's been removed. He's obviously been a very outspoken Orthodox bishop. Um, he apparently refused to abandon the people who were um, attending the traditional Latin mass in his diocese and so did not follow directives from Rome to implement um, uh, Traditionis Custodes, which we is is a problem, of course, but it, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a sort of a nuclear bomb going off that he didn't he didn't follow this. And then a second thing that has been raised is that um, he openly criticized the Holy Father and said that he un- was undermining the, the foundations of the faith. Um, let's start again with, with from this canon law aspect. I mean, there must be procedures, strict procedures 
for the removal of a bishop from his own diocese. Could you explain a bit of that for us? Sure. Uh, yes, removal from the diocese would be uh, the effect of, of verifying uh, through a canonical process that he had committed an offense against canon law, which would mean an offense against faith or the good order of the church. There's no accusation that I know of that he's committed a canonical crime. Uh, now, the Vatican, for whatever reason, decided they wanted to send an apostolic uh, visitor team. Two bishops came uh, to come to the diocese and question people, including Bishop Strickland. Uh, the results of that uh, led to this action by the Holy Father, uh, but they were, the results were never published and no reason was given for his removal. So we can only speculate, uh, was it about his public statements? Was it about uh, his failure to implement Traditionis Custodis? Uh, was it for other reasons? We don't know. Now we can suspect it was precisely because of his outspokenness. Now, in canon law, removal from a diocese, privation of office is the technical term, has, is, a, is a penal measure. It ha, so therefore, it has to follow canonical procedures. There should have been what we would call an administrative process or a canonical trial, and he needed the right to defense. I wonder if his right to defense was, was uh, and due process was observed. And then secondly, was he given a decree stating the reasons? Because in canon law, when a superior takes an action, uh, which he wishes to enforce, he simply doesn't say, well, I think this is what I'd like to happen. He has to issue a decree and state its reasons even briefly. And then the person who's affected has the right to try to bring to the attention of the superior, well, I have contrary facts, uh, which can either uh, you know, exonerate me from what you think I did or to prove uh, that the interpretation that you've given to it is incorrect. So canonically, this is a mess and uh, it doesn't look good uh, for the Catholic Church when uh, a bishop who is known to be orthodox and bold and courageous is removed. Uh, at the same time, when the, Arch the Archbishop of Antwerp in Belgium just announced a month or so ago uh, that euthanasia is uh, permissible in some cases. So you have a bishop who wants to kill old people and say it's moral, and then you have a bishop who says it's, not, it's wrong to do things like that, and we wish the Pope to enforce the rule. And in fact, it's, it's very interesting because the Pope a few years ago said you cannot bless same-sex unions. He did that through the doctrine of the faith. Uh, and Bishop Strickland, of course, supported that. Uh, but that's not in his favor anymore. Whereas the bishops who violated the Pope's ruling and uh, flaunted it, including the bishops in Belgium, nothing happened to them. So people are frustrated. Yeah, and of course we have the example of, of virtually the entire uh, uh, bishops' conference in Germany, which is far more, um, uh, I, I think, ignoring of what the Holy Father wanted. He's tried to reel them in a little bit here and there with a few words. He hasn't really been very vigorous. But I mean, compared to the, the radical departures from the, the doctrine of the faith, it, they seem to be routinely practicing. And we know that there's that one bishop who was actually talked about blessing um, same-sex unions. He's directed his, mm -hmm. his, uh, his priest to, uh, to, uh, to do that in certain instances. Um, it's puzzling. It, and yeah. just to get this clear on, on the canonical point, the mm -hmm. Holy Father does have the authority to just do this, on, to circumvent the whole legal process and do it on his own steam. Um, is that, that's correct, right? Um it, it is correct in the sense that he has, a, has supreme authority in the church and he doesn't need uh, to seek permission or authorization from any other authority. Yes, he has the right to do that. But, um, you know, the good order of the church demands that the canonical order be observed because if not observed by the man in charge, then the chances are people underneath aren't going to observe it. So, you know, if the Pope is angry that a bishop's not implementing traditionis custodes, well, then we should say, well, Holy Father, okay, but there are other canonical provisions that should be observed. According, when you fire a bishop, issue a decree, tell the reason, and give the bishop a chance to respond to it. And that hasn't happened in this case. That I know of. Uh, no one's spoken about a decree and then reason. So, um, yeah, but, you know, it, it, we say that the Pope is the servant of the servants of God, you know, the service mode. And the Pope himself, you know, wants to cultivate that impress, not impression, but that real, I mean, the way he sees himself as he's at the service of the people of God, that's a wonderful thing. 
but it's contradicted when you act in a manner in which somebody who disagrees with you is cast aside. So I think the Pope needs to reflect on that and see, is this really the way that we're going to advance the gospel? Yeah. Well, I mean, there certainly is an asymmetry in, who, in who's tolerated and who's not tolerated at this moment in the church. Um, someone we, we, we uh, know, I don't, don't want to get anybody in trouble, so I'm not going to mention any names, I think has been in contact with the bishop and asked him if he's going to be at the uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, CCB meeting this week. Um, our American bishops are meeting starting um, today, the, 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 the day when this will come out, which is Monday, November 13th. Uh, they'll be meeting this entire week for their um, regular annual meeting up in Baltimore. They'll spend the whole week discussing various issues like the Eucharistic revival and you know some of the other things that, that they're concerned about. Um, we, I've heard that Bishop Strickland is going to be there, but not to participate, he's going to pray. Um, I know this is kind of speculative, but how do you think our bishops are going to be reacting this week? I mean, it's a shock that uh, a fellow bishop um, who I, I, I think... <laughs> We can't say that there's anything here that deserves sort of capital punishment, or at least we don't know of anything that deserves capital punishment. But um, just let me ask you to speculate a little bit. I mean, a lot of this is going to be said off camera uh, in private, but one has to anticipate that they're going to think that this is really quite something. I've heard that some of the bishops in Texas warned the Vatican not to do this. They would create a lot of... Um, backlash and resentment and anger here in America? Well, this is an, it's a very interesting question. Uh, you know, when he's removed as Bishop of Tyler, uh, the question now is, well, where is he the Bishop of? Because in the Catholic Church, a Bishop is always attached to a flock. So if you're a Bishop of a diocese, that's your flock. If you're an auxiliary Bishop, you are a titular Bishop of a, of a diocese, usually a diocese that you know, is no longer functioning. So the legal fiction is always a bishop has a flock. Uh, now, retired bishops are called bishops emeritus. Retired bishops are entitled to go to the uh, meetings of the bishops conference. So what is Bishop Strickland's status? We haven't heard that from the Vatican. That's another legal quandary. Now, as regards how they are going to react to it, uh, your guess is as good as mine. I think in general, American bishops would say that while they may have disagreed with uh, Bishop Strickland on some questions and they may have disagreed with his style, they may not have been comfortable with his uh, presence in the internet world. I don't think most of them would say he deserved to be removed from his diocese. Now, as we know, the American uh, church comes under criticism from the Pope. And when he was meeting with Jesuits, I think it was in Portugal, he used the word reactionary to describe Catholics in the United States which is a very harsh political term. It has origin in Marxist doctrine. And it basically review, uh, it, it reveals that both a misunderstanding of who American Catholics are and a politicization of what uh, they think. So, you know, if you and I, uh, in our podcasts or writings, try to defend Catholic doctrine, uh, we're not a, a enemies of the church. And I think that's kind of the implication who wants to bring reactionaries in for a discussion? No, you want to exclude them. So I think this is an example of the American bishops are being given a message, which is either you repeat what Rome says or you're going to get in trouble. And I think the duty of a bishop and of look, all of us is we, if we disagree with the Pope respectfully but forcefully, we bring it to his attention for his benefit and for ours. And that's really, you know, we discuss blessings of same-sex couples. This has never happened in the life of the church for 2,000 years. Now we're told basically three weeks ago that priests should find ways to do this that don't confuse them with blessings and marriages. If we say, wait a minute, let's stop. In what world does a priest standing in front of two men who are already civilly married and ask for a blessing, in what world do we think this is a Christian action? The Pope seems to think that, but we're entitled to disagree. Well, I hear from a lot of uh, readers and, and, and listeners and viewers that he hasn't explicitly kind of allowed this blessing of same-sex couples. But we, you know, you and I have covered this for a long time. There, there's just a, an awful lot of static and an awful lot of confusion and probably deliberate confusion. Um, we don't see the, the proponents of the traditional Latin mass or Bishop Strickland showing up 
uh, in the midst of the synod on synodality for, for these happy uh, photo ops with, with the Holy Father. But we do see uh, people who've been pushing very hard for LGBT and uh, other things um, who were kind of fed in there. Father, we're out of time, uh, but thank you again for your, your clarity about this. We're all praying for Bishop Strickland, for um, people who are suffering from the, these various sexual uh, identity problems, for the Holy Father himself and for all of us. So uh, that's it for this time, and uh, we'll see you next time when there's something to report. <laughs>